Greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus and welcome to Bible in a Year. We have reached day 200. My God, can you believe it? For 200 days consecutively-ish, we've gotten into the Word of God and spent time in the Bible seeking the face of God and desiring to know who he is 200 days. Why? In my book, that's a reason to celebrate. And I think that on Monday, I should make a point to get myself a very large peach milkshake from Chick-fil-A. And, and on top of that, I don't know if where you dwell, they have cheesecake factories, but I think that it is definitely in order to get a mango cheesecake. Yes. Oh, God. <sighs> the glory of the Lord is upon us. Hallelujah, Jesus. 200 days. Congratulations to you, all of you that have stuck with it. Those of you that have recently joined, you're in a good place. We're getting into the word of God. We've made a commitment to do it and we've been consistent. This is more than half the year now that we have stuck with it. And I believe that God is blessing us through this. I believe that we are all being sharpened through these readings, sharpened through these reflections and the comments that are uh, on this feed. And I'm just grateful to God. God has blessed this community. It's grown a little bit and hey, this is what it's about, man. It's about establishing kingdom. It's about fellowship and it's about propagating the truth. We were all in this together. So if this is your first time watching one of these videos, Bible in a Year series, this is a video series, a devotional that endeavors to read through the entire Bible from cover to cover, from word to every single word, every single verse, every single book, every single chapter, everything in this book. We've endeavored to read it in the year 2020. We're almost halfway through. The journey has been a great one. I want to encourage you to join us, make a commitment, either from right here, day 200, and move forward with us, or if you feel like you have the faith and the mind to do so, go back to day number one and start from there and move your way through. Many of you have already decided to do that, that have recently joined. I welcome you all. It's so good to have you here. And uh, all of the videos are available. I, I finished creating a playlist so that if you go to the channel, you can just go to the playlist. You don't have to sift through all of the other 200 videos that are on the channel in addition to Bible in a year. So glory be to God, uh, bringing some organization. I am growing. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you all for your prayers that are helping me be to be helping me to be the best me that I can be. My God, I had to get that one out there. Praise Jesus. I do have some verses here that I want to reflect on with you. Just some thoughts to share and uh, some speculation, maybe a little bit. And I want to unpack this word. I'll be reading from the King James version of the Bible, but you can feel free to follow along with whatever version you have or whatever version it is that you are comfortable with. I have one verse in the book of Proverbs and we'll find that in chapter 17 and we're going to look at verse 22. The Bible says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A broken spirit drieth the bones. When I read that, it took me immediately to the book of Ezekiel. I believe it is in chapter 37 where we find a narrative of the prophet and the prophet is in a valley and the Bible describes the valley as being full of bones. 
not just bones, but dry bones, very dry bones. The Bible says here in Ezekiel 37, 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. It was the spirit of the Lord that carried the prophet to a dry place. Oh, yes, Jesus. Let that Holy Ghost hit. It was the spirit of the Lord that carried the prophet, the man of God, into a place that was very dry. And this dry place was full of bones. And the narrative continues and caused me to pass by them round about. The Spirit of the Lord caused the prophet, the man of God, to pass by the bones round and about, all around, all throughout the valley, all throughout the dry places where the bones were scattered. It was the Spirit of the Lord that took the prophet, the man of God, and placed him in these dry place, in this valley that was dry and filled with bones. And the Bible says, and lo, they were very dry. The bones were very dry. If you've ever eaten chicken, and uh, once you finish eating that chicken wing and you got a pile of bones on your plate some of them bones they still have some moisture from where the chicken was and uh, you just ate it you just prepared it what is significant about the concept of dry bones is it's telling us that these bones have been dead for a long time Anything that has dry bones has been dead for a long time. Let's slip back over into the proverb and it says, But a broken spirit drieth the bones. A broken spirit dries out the bones. If the bones are being dried out, that means they are dying. That means perhaps they are dead. And a broken spirit, what is it about the spirit that can dry out the bones? You've heard that word, that, that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. That's a lie. The devil lied to us and some of us have believed that sticks and stones will break your bones but words will break your heart words have a way of impacting the spirit remember the bible says in hebrews 4 and 12 that the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The words that we speak can pierce into the soul, past the soul and into the spirit. And because they affect the spirit, they can consequently affect the bones, the joints and marrow are the bones. So the words that we speak, they have influence, they have impact. And the Bible tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We must be careful as human beings. It's just human nature. The fact that you're human and you have the faculty of speech that you can say things. We have to be careful what we say because the words that we say have the ability and the potential to break someone's spirit. And a broken spirit drieth the bones. We don't want to be responsible for speaking death to somebody and those words break their spirit. Words like, you'll never be able to do that. Words like, you'll always be that way. Those are 
curses that we speak out of our mouth. Those are death words that we speak. They penetrate the spirit. They, They penetrate the soul. They get into the spirit and they break things. A broken spirit dries the bones. Some of you may be walking around with a broken spirit because of the things that other people have said to you. And it might be that one word in that one moment just at the right time that did it. That one word. People have said Thousands of words to you, sentences, paragraphs on paragraphs. But in that one moment, that one time, that one person said that one word and pow! A blow to the spirit that you've not yet recovered from. Sharoboko idiaroma. Hallelujah. This is a great place to take five minutes of faith. Whoa, Jesus. Glory be to God. That one word. The Bible says that a word spoken in due season. I don't know what it says. Let's find out what the Bible says. A word spoken. I know what it says. I know the gist of it. Ah. Proverbs 15, 23. Look at that. We've already read that. I knew it was in there somewhere. See, that's what happens when you read the Bible in a year and you read the whole counsel of God. The spirit of God comes and reacts with the word of God and brings it back to your remembrance. And here we are remembering something that we've read. Proverbs 15, 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. Words of life. We have the ability to do that. Excuse me, madam. That's a lovely sweater that you're wearing. You know what I mean? Words of life. Why, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You know what I mean? Life words. And a word spoken in due season, how good is it? That's a life word, a life word spoken in due season. How good is it? But if there is a life word and the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue, then there must also by logic and reason be a death word. What happens if a death word is spoken in due season? We see it right here in Proverbs 17, just a couple of chapters later. A broken spirit drieth the bones. These are death words that have punched the bones, the spirit. Oh, God. The spirit. Oh, Jesus. Just like the bones are a structure to the body, the spirit is the bones to the immaterial part of our being. Like your soul and your heart and your mind. And it seems that the spirit is the strong part. You can have a broken heart and still be all right. But if your spirit is breached, if your spirit is broken, it is a death that we're living in. But. Wait, listen, it's not all doom and gloom. I wanted to start with this part first, but the first verse of the first part of that verse says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Hallelujah. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. How could that be? Why would that be? Well, let's. Let's dig, let's unpack, let's connect Bible with Bible. Let's let the word define itself. Here's a great example of rightly dividing a word. We know, because we've read the Bible, that the Bible says of itself that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth can only speak what's in the heart. And if the heart is merry, if the heart is full of joy, if the heart is whole and healed and it speaks from a place of healing, it speaks from a place of health, 
then the words that we speak are life words. A merry heart doeth good because a merry heart speaks life words. And we have the ability to speak those life words in due season. Is that why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. That joy, the answer of his mouth that expresses joy first originates in a heart that is filled with joy. And the word spoken in due season, how good is it? A merry heart doeth good. And a word see, spo- and a good word spoken in due season, how good it is. And it's like medicine. How many of you taken NyQuil before? When you're sick. How many of you got allergies and your schnoz gets to swollen and flares up and you can't breathe and the nasal passage is blocked and your sinuses are acting up and sometimes there is a continual flow of mucus. Somehow there's a constant supply. Your eyes might be watering. You're sneezing. You got that itch in your throat and then you go and you get some Zyrtec or some Benadryl. And yeah, many minutes later, you begin to feel a relief of the symptoms. How many of you taken NyQuil before? You got a cold, you got the flu or something. And that NyQuil knocks you out. I mean, just pow. And you're just, you know what I mean? You're gone. It's where you want to be. You're not coughing. You're getting some rest. It relieves you. It, the medicine aids you to get healthy again. Not only does it help you to get healthy, but the medicine helps to deal with the I feel the Holy Ghost. The medicine, not only does it position you to get healthy, but it helps you to deal with the symptoms that bother you and the, oh God, and the truth is that a merry heart A heart that speaks words of life. Not only do these words have an ability to put us in a place to where we can be healed or our neighbor. Not only do our words have the ability to place our neighbor in a position for him to be healed, but our words also have the power to relieve some of the symptoms of the broken spirit and the dry bones. Some of the words that we speak have the ability to relieve the heartache that your neighbor might be going through. The words that we speak carry within them life and the ability to bring relief to the brokenhearted and to the wounding and to the hurting and to those that are in depression and to those that feel alone and to those that feel rejected and to those that feel like nobody loves me. Your words carry the very, mm, hallelujah, the very essence of life that can not only position them to be healed and to recover, but to soothe the symptoms of a broken spirit and a dry bone hallelujah the power of the spoken word let us therefore speak life holy ghost help us to be sensitive to the needs of those around us. Help us to recognize situations and opportunities, Lord God, where we can speak life, where our words, because we have a merry heart and we can speak from a place of healing and we can speak from a whole heart, Lord God. And the words that we speak, they carry joy and life and healing properties to those, God, that would be in need. Help us to recognize these situations Help us to recognize and to be sensitive, Lord God, to moments like this where we can be a blessing to somebody that's hurting and wounded and distraught. Help us, oh God, in this fashion to give of ourselves the health that's on the inside transmitted through the words of life that we speak into the hearts 
and bones of those that are wounded and broken. And we're going to glorify you in doing so. Hallelujah. What just happened was that which was spoken by the brother Klaus in the last video Bible in a year. Five minutes of faith. This wasn't five minutes, but praise God, you've got the idea. Let us walk in that. Let's practice that. You're going to get the moments to where you just, uh, I just feel like I need to pray. Go ahead. Give yourself to it. Go ahead. I don't know. Pull the car over if you got the shout or something. Go ahead at Walmart while you're there. Slide into an empty aisle and have a moment with your maker. My God is good. Peace be with you all. Let's go to the book of Romans. Not romance, but Romans. Somebody, somebody said, oh, I, I received that life word, romance. Yes, God, I received that. <laughs> uh, drink it up. Drink it up. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. My God is good. My God is a good God. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So the purpose of the law is to make me more jacked up. Father, what is this? But, yeah, see, don't forget the but. But where sin abounded. <sighs> Praise Jesus. Grace did much more abound. Wherever you got sin in your life that you are struggling with and you just feel like, why is this sin prospering? Why is this thing flourishing in me? Why does it feel like sin is abounding? I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to do right by God and the more I try to do right, the more wrong I seem to do. There seems to be an inverse effect of my efforts and I can't quite wrap my mind around it. Ever been there? Well, here is hope for you. The Bible says where sin abounded, it means where there's a lot of it, grace did much more abound. Not just more abound, but much more abound. So whatever sin it is that you're struggling with, whatever sin it is that you're dealing with, there's a whole lot more grace than there is sin to help you. All you got to do is come boldly to the throne of grace so that you can obtain mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need. That's Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 memorize that verse because it shall oft remind you. I know, I'm slipping in that King Jimmy. That's all right. It shall oft remind you, hey, pray. Hey, it's a good place to come to the throne. Hey, that event that you just experienced is an awesome segue into five minutes of faith. Why? Because we need grace. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to touch Amos real quick. We are in chapter 8 now, verse 2. We are finishing up this minor prophet. I don't know why my spirit just said, thank God. You couldn't hear it. But in my spirit, I said, thank God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. Maybe I struggled through this one. Maybe I want to understand Amos and I just haven't gotten to the place to where I can understand you, brother. I don't, it's not nothing personal. I just, I want to know you and, okay. Verse two, verse two. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? 
And I said, a basket of summer fruit, mangoes, apples, cherries. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. When I read that, I said, oh, God, that's a hard word. The end is come upon my people. I will not, I will not again pass by them anymore. There is a day that has been appointed by Almighty God from eternity past that will be the end of all things in this age. I'm speaking about this age, not like forever and always, no. This age. There is a day appointed where this age that we are living in now will come to an end. And having that in mind will help to put things in perspective. I love how you feed me, Father. I love how you just, you just, you don't leave me hanging. The end will be upon us one of these days. And we're going to see it. Now, I don't know about the specific timing that this prophet is talking about where the scripture says, I will not again pass by them anymore. That sounds like a permanent thing, like a, I don't think that this will change kind of thing. So my wonder is, in what reference is this prophecy? So we continue to read on Amos chapter 9, verse 1. I developed some thoughts in reading. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door that the posts may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. This looks like there's a judgment coming that cannot be escaped. You cannot flee from it. You cannot run from it. You cannot be delivered from it. It's a judgment that's coming. And when it comes, it's going to be here, baby. I don't want to be a part of that judgment unless I am helping God execute that judgment from a safe place on my horse riding behind King Jesus. These are my sentiments. Verse 2 of Amos chapter 9. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. What if there is a judgment coming so severe? And so bad that it'll make people want to dig down to hell trying to escape this judgment. And God says, hey, if you're going to dig your way into hell, I will help you. I don't want to be there as a recipient of this judgment. I don't want that kind of help from the Lord. Don't know about you, but I've decided and he that escapeth, oh, no, 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 that's okay. Yeah, let's go forward. And though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Verse 8, behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. This sounds like the judgment, man. This sounds like Armageddon. This sounds like when Jesus comes back. Yeah, there's a verse in Revelation that tells us that men will look for death 
They will seek death and they'll not find it. Let me see if I can find that verse. It's in Revelation. That I said that wound overcame him with death and said, man, oh, mm, there it is. Revelation 9, 6. It's mm, also chapter 9. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. In any case, that's interesting. But there is a sinful kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the devil. It will be destroyed. Thank God, because right now we're in the middle of a kingdom clash. And the enemy has somewhat of a freedom to do what he kind of wants to do. Not, not the whole time, not all the time, because there are men and women of God, such as yourselves, that are rising up and praying against the power of darkness. Thank you for praying against the powers of darkness, for your aim to seek and destroy the works of the devil. It's what we want to do. Verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Hmm. Again, there's a verse in Revelation. I believe it is Revelation chapter 19. The Bible discloses to us that there is one coming on a horse. Let's see. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. One, two, skip a few. Where does it say that he will destroy them with the sword of his mouth? It says that here somewhere. I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Look at that. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Wow. That makes me want to pray and be close to Jesus. Let us pray. Verse 15. And I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be pulled. Up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. This looks like a place of stability that God is going to bring his people ultimately. And God does want stability for our lives. He does bring us into a place of stability. Just like the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, eventually he brought them into the promised land. And that resembled or, or that symbolized a stable place they were stable and i believe that god wants to bring us into a stable place we just have to keep believing and keep following and keep on praying brothers and sisters may the lord bless you and keep you and may he make his face to shine upon you may he be gracious to you and give you peace God bless y'all. See y'all in the next video. Hey, check out the videos and the links.